Hi, everybody. Uh, as Mary said, I am a consultant. So I work for a consultancy, which means that I probably get to see uh, more organizations and their approaches to developing software than people who do not work at a consultancy. And I also talk to people a lot, my coworkers, who also again, see a different set of organizations. So sometimes it feels like being at a conference every week. And that's great for discovering similar patterns, but also, of course, similar challenges. And one of those challenges that lots of larger organizations have had over the past few years is that of how to coordinate autonomous teams. So why do we want autonomous teams? It's, it's been this great, uh, or it's been this buzzword over the past few years. And it's, of course, not that new of a trend. It was already hidden in the second page of the Agile Manifesto, the principles page. And there's one principle that says, the best architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. So in a way, I think this term autonomous teams is probably kind of a renaissance of that idea of self-organizing teams. And why autonomy? What are we hoping to get out of that? Uh, a few reasons. Uh, one of them is uh, motivation. So uh, motiv uh, autonomy is a powerful factor in intrinsic motivation, and it also helps with creativity and people taking initiative. And then another reason is that we want some flexibility. So uh, different problems need different approaches to solving them sometimes. So we want to have a certain amount of variety where it makes sense. And then it's really helpful if the teams who are close to the problem are empowered to decide for themselves when they want to deviate from maybe some central norms and they have to, be, they have to feel safe to deviate from that. So you don't want needless variation, but you need flexibility sometimes to solve things in different ways. And finally, and this is, I think, the original reason uh, why we want autonomous teams, is scaling in the sense of organizational scaling. So the development and the design process, they just don't work anymore as the, the group who is doing it is getting larger and larger if you have everybody in the same group. So if you want to build more, you need more people, and then you need to coordinate the work between those people. So you almost have to split them up into smaller groups because otherwise it doesn't work anymore. And autonomy here is also uh, means decentralization in a way, because the larger you get, the harder it is for a central group to make all the decisions, because they just won't have enough information anymore to make good decisions. So autonomy is a solution to scaling, organizational scaling. It's not just the magic solution, though, because with that necessity come new challenges. And those challenges come when we combine that with architecture. So some of those challenges when you have uh, lots of autonomous teams in your organization and it comes to architecture is that you risk duplicate work or even worse inconsistent duplicate work so because maybe teams didn't know that they were both working on the same thing there's risk of that needless variation that I just mentioned uh, you have the extra effort of coordinating all the work and the dependencies between the teams and also you often have challenges with staff mobility so if you uh, want to move people around between teams and you have that unavoidable level of variation across the organization, then it becomes a bit harder. So those are just a few of the examples um, of challenges when you have autonomous teams and you want to have a good architecture in the sense of an architecture that supports your organization's goals and that makes you ultimately move faster. So when you're in charge of um, leading an organization like that with all those autonomous teams and you want good architecture, um, what do you do? You kind of say, oh, we need some governance for this. Um, and might be a bit of a, a cheesy approach, but I did actually look up the word govern to govern in the Merriam-Webster dictionary. And I was very glad because I found out that there are actually two different categories of what that word could mean. So one of those categories is meanings like manipulate, rule, control, or restrain. And another category of definitions of the word are to guide, have decisive influence, serve as deciding principle, or exert a determining or guiding influence. So you kind of have this dichotomy of ruling and guiding. And I think this also reflects how different organizations are interpreting what architecture governance means for them. So um, to kind of, you kind of have to find your flavor of what you need in your organization. And what probably most of you want is uh, kind of a mix of like it being uh, guided autonomy. So you don't want to be too prescriptive, but at the same time you want to avoid chaos. So you need some of those rules sprinkled on top of that. 
So how do you do that? I don't have like a definitive comprehensive answer for you, but I have a few building blocks that I have in mind when I think about this, and I want to walk you through them and also give a few examples of uh, things that I've seen in organizations. So I want to start with a reminder of something that might seem obvious, but um, I already just mentioned that ultimately we don't want architecture for architecture's sake or to kind of satisfy our feeling of everything being uh, our, our need for everything to seem neat, but ultimately architecture needs to serve the organization's goals or the business's goals. And um, the, the developers on the autonomous teams, they are shaping the respective pieces of the architecture and they need to have a similar understanding of how their piece can ultimately contribute to the organization's goals. And this might seem obvious, but I'm still seeing that a lot, that developers are not really asking for that context, that they don't really seem uh, that interested in it. And on the other side, the business side or the product side, they make assumptions that developers don't really need to know that much about this. And I also find that in myself, I'm often so into the tech that I kind of forget to ask extra questions. And when I make myself ask them, I almost always find out new things that I didn't know before, and I regret that I didn't ask those questions earlier. So um, you need to make sure that both of those sides kind of push and pull context about the organization's goals. So if you are somebody with relevant context, think about how to push it to the teams. A very simple way, at least if you're co-located, is to visualize things in the team space, like this example here on the slide, where there were the, this business unit's uh, three main goals in order of priority that we constantly had up in the team space and could refer to. You could also work on a team or business unit's mission statement, maybe for the next quarter. That also really helps uh, show the other teams what you're working on and also check with stakeholders if this is actually what's needed right now. And if you do need more context on the uh, business or the organization, which I would argue as developers and especially as lead developers we should all have, then try to uh, consciously pull it more and remind yourself of that. Like the minimum should be that we all understand either how the business we work for makes money, or the product that we work for, and uh, where the cost for that comes from, or if you, you work for a nonprofit organization, of course, uh, what is the mission and how does this product contribute to that? Because otherwise you might be uh, ending up with something like this, so you might be solving imaginary issues. <laughs> I was kind of thinking a bit about that when we were talking about performance before, because that's also uh, something, of course, that goes into that, like um, that we all think about what we're um, fixing those things for. So the techies need to understand the organization's context and goals uh, to be able to move in the same direction together, but on the other hand also the business or the product side um, needs to have a certain level of understanding of the architecture and what we need there to help us define and prioritize our architecture requirements on that context. So what do I need by, uh, mean by architecture requirements? It's basically what is also referred to as illities, or some people call it non-functional requirements or cross-functional requirements. When I did a dry run of this talk to some of my colleagues before, one of them was really adamant that I should not use the term architecture requirements because they are also product requirements. And I would agree, but I think in this context it's worth pointing out that they are also slightly different. So the trouble with them, with them is that there are a lot of them. So this is just like a, a, a brief excerpt of that. Here you can actually see uh, a lot more. So you need to find out which ones are actually relevant for you. And that might also be different on uh, different levels in the organization. So some of them might be very different for each of the autonomous teams and they actually decide what's important for them. And some of them might be relevant on the overall organization level or business unit level and teams need to coordinate to reach them um, together and also how to measure them together. And some of them might be highly relevant, somewhat relevant or not relevant at all. And this is also where that, that duality comes in again of the ruling versus guiding. Because for some of them you might want a lot more uh, ruling, like something like compliance for example. Um, and for some of them maybe you just want a guidance based approach or you just tell a team, okay, this is totally your domain, you figure out what performance requirements you have for your particular product. And then you need to prioritize those as well, and that's where it becomes tricky if there's so many of them, right? And um, one thing you can do for this, some of you might know this uh, exercise, the trade-off sliders. It's often used to um, help all the stakeholders prioritize the um, competitive priorities of things like uh, budget, scope, time, and quality. 
And you can also do that with your architecture requirements. For example, if you're building a web application that needs some offline capability where you need to download some, some data onto the user's uh, machine or device, then that, might, that offline availability might be kind of um, in tension with things like data privacy or portability. So you can use the slider to have a discussion around that, that those things, you cannot have them all 100% at the same time and then prioritize them. So, and then one way to achieve alignment that I and also my, my uh, colleagues have seen in larger organizations over the past years is to create a set of architecture principles for the engineering organization. And that's what I want to spend a larger part of the talk on now. So what is an architecture principle? I like this definition by Owen Woods that says, it's a declarative statement made with the intention of guiding architectural design decisions in order to achieve one or more qualities of a system. So this is a long sentence, so I try to break it down into some boxes. So it's a declarative statement, and the statement is, its purpose is to help us guide our decisions. So if the principle doesn't help us guide our decision making, then it's not very useful for us. And ultimately, we want those decisions to lead to uh, system qualities that we want, and those are basically those uh, architecture requirements that I just talked about. So it's always helpful to be very aware of what those requirements are for us. And I want to give an example, and don't get too hung up on the content of the example, so we want to stay on the meta level of how it's actually structured. So this is an example from out in the wild on the internet. The title is Smarts in the Nodes, not the Network. And then there's a bit of a description that says, we want systems to be as decoupled and cohesive as possible and not centrally choreographed. So this is definitely a declarative statement, check. But as a developer, just seeing this, I think would not really help me make a decision yet because it's not a lot of information. I would still ask myself, what does that actually mean for my daily work? So that's why there's usually a bit more than just the title and the description. So this is the full uh, content of that particular principle. So you have that declarative statement at the top. Then you have uh, something uh, titled rationale, so why do we want this? So in this part, you can put a lot of those qualities of the system that you hope to improve with this. So it's almost like an hypo uh, a hypothesis. You think that by having this principle, you will improve these qualities of a system. In this case, it was things like we want to evolve over time and we want to change quickly, and we think that will help us with that. And then with implications and examples, you can, make, you can talk more about how this can guide your decisions or the actual practices on the ground. And this structure, I don't know if some of you recognize it, it comes from an uh, architectural principle definition from TOGAF. I don't know if, uh, does anybody know what TOGAF is? <coughs> I have very few hands. So it's like an open framework for enterprise architects to do enterprise architecture. And this is one of the pieces in there that one of them that I actually find quite useful. Also one of the few ones that I know personally, I have to admit. <laughs> um, so this example was from John Lewis's software engineering principles. John Lewis is a department store chain in the UK. I was not involved in creating these at all. I've never worked with them. They're just out there on the internet and lots of organizations are actually putting their own principles out there and you can get uh, inspired by them. And that's basically what they did. They took that TOGA structure, they came up with 18 principles and um, yeah, are using those in their uh, daily work. So that's one way to do it. Another structure I've seen is what I call in my head the three column approach. Uh, so this is a, is, this is a uh, a graphic from Sam Newman's book, Building Microservices. And what you do here is you have those three columns, and on the left you list your strategic goals, so basically those organizational goals I talked about before. And then in the middle you have your architecture principles, and on the right you have design and delivery practices, so basically bringing those principles to life, having kind of uh, practical guidance for performing your tasks. And so it's kind of rationale and implications put a different way. So your rationale is always that you want to achieve these goals, and the implications are what do you actually do on the ground. An example might be that your strategic goals are you want to enter a new market, and you want to focus more on customer centricity, and you think that maybe uh, being more data-driven will help you with that. And then you come up with a snappy title for being more data-driven, like facts over opinions, and then there might be some practices that you think will help you with that, like hypothesis-driven development and data democratization. So these are just a few 
architecture principles that you can find out there on the internet or that I've seen um, at organizations. So some of these might seem very obvious to you, right? So you might ask yourself, aren't those just like good practices that I find on the internet anyway? Like, yeah, we want our uh, application to be maintainable, we want to scale horizontally, we want it to be production ready, so it's kind of like, duh, you know, that's already all out there in all those books and blog posts. So why should you bother with your own principles? I think one advantage of it is that it helps give you focus. I actually think 18 principles is maybe even a bit too much, because for me it should not be an attempt at having a comprehensive li list of principles, because that comprehensive list is out there on the internet. But you should think about what do you want to focus on and where do you want to get better in this moment. I actually think a success criteria for a principle is that you feel like you can throw it away because it's become business as usual. And then maybe you can uh, replace that one with another one. So maybe have five or so and really focus on them and see if you can get rid of some of them. Another reason why you might want your own is to achieve consensus. So if you want those principles to be guiding for teams who still take their own decisions, then they have to have a certain level of abstraction. They can't be too specific. So there's lots of room for interpretation. So the principles or the journey to finding them can be a great tool to have those conversations with each other and figure out what do you actually mean by them. So you have people with different experience levels, different uh, previous things that they have done uh, in the organization, so you can get them all together and talk about this and actually also learn from each other and figure out what it means for your particular context. And finally, it might be helpful for change management, so to kind of get an official blessing for some things. For example, depending on your organizational culture, you might want to make it explicit that failing fast is now really something that is wanted. So if previously um, there's been a culture of where people have kind of been punished for failing and now you actually want this whole experimentation and failing fast, then you might actually need this official thing where management says, yes, this is what we want and this is we understand that this is what it will look like and you kind of get this uh, safer environment for people to point to when they then actually try that and say, you know, this is what we achieved with this or this is what we need to change about it. So then if you decided, okay, let's try that, let's put together our own five principles, how do you actually find them? And I've seen three approaches to this over time. The first one was kind of top down. So there was this architecture board of people who got together, I don't know, every two months or so, and they came up with this, these principles. And the great thing about it was that there, was, there were very experienced people in the room who had first-hand knowledge of the business context. The bad thing about it was that they weren't directly involved in the development in the teams, and they also did not, not document rationale for why they chose these principles. So that made it very hard for people to accept them and not question them. The second approach I've seen um, was kind of a step-by-step -step approach, and in this organization it was really helpful that they had a mission at that time. So they had a big replatforming project on the way, and this mission kind of drove the creation of their principles. So they had an architecture guild and got together, and whenever they got they came across the next challenge in this replatforming. They thought about, you know, should this be a principle or how could we make this a more general guidance for the future? So that was very helpful for them. And then the third approach was also kind of upfront, but then not make it uh, so make it very collaborative with everybody and also make sure that it's not set in stone, but that you iterate on it and that it's not like a fixed thing. And I want to give you one example now of a workshop that you can do to come up with an initial list of principles. Oh, that was the laser pointer instead of the arrow. <laughs> <laughs> so some of you might recognize this. This is a, this is a common format for a retrospective where on the right you kind of say, this is where we want to go, this is our light tower, and then the boats are kind of you and the team or the organization, and then there's wind moving those boats forward, there's anchors holding them back, and there's risks on the way that you don't know if they will manifest yet, but you think that maybe there's something there to look out for. So you start with the goals and requirements, and those are basically those organizational goals and the architecture requirements. So ideally those things are already 
quite well defined when you <laughs> have this workshop. But even if it's not defined, you don't have to wait for it to be really official. You can also start with some generic ones like faster time to market. It's something that I would say almost everybody wants, right? So you can start with something like that and also have this workshop with business and tech people together. Like it shouldn't just be the tech people. And if you do this and it's not so well defined yet, it will also put some pressure on, on the business or product side to be more explicit um, about um, what those goals are. So and then wind, anchor and risks, those are basically like a SWOT analysis, right? So they are strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. It just doesn't sound so consulting-y <laughs> when, you, when you put it with uh, wind and anchors and cliffs, right? <laughs> so you, you kind of, you know, do your, uh, your common thing that you would do in a retrospective. You brainstorm around these areas and then you cluster. And maybe based on those clusters, you can brainstorm some principles. Like what could be principles that help us um, get away from those anchors and what could be principles that can strengthen our wind? And focus especially on the ones with cross-team relevance, because those are the ones that are important for you to coordinate those autonomous teams. And then once you've brainstormed those principles, you can split up into smaller groups and uh, fill out each of those principles more. So this is basically another version of the name, statement, rationale, implications that you can use for people to work together and, and fill this out more. And then once you have those principles, how do you make them more relevant to people? Again, the implications. What does this mean for my daily work, for the practices I should use? And one of the things you can do here to structure those principles is to create your own technology radar. As you can see here in the background, this is uh, Zalando's version uh, of it from um, last year. Who here knows about uh, the technology radar format? This is actually... So full disclosure, this is a format that my... Uh, that comes from my employer, ThoughtWorks, and it, we usually do it for, um, for the whole market, like what we see at our clients, but um, if you do it for your own organization, it's actually slightly different. So it's basically a format to organize and document the concrete practices and technologies that you are using in the organization or that you want to use or not use in the organization. And you have these four rings where you put this, so these green dots <coughs> represent your technologies or practices, and the things that you put in adopt, I think it's probably not readable in the back, are things that have proven to work within your enterprise and that are well supported. So you put things in there that are, have been in production for a while that you want everybody to use ideally if they have a similar problem to solve because you already have a lot of experience with it. Then in trial, you put things that are promising and you're experimenting with them in one or more teams. So maybe there's one team who already has this in production and they are playing around with and you're collecting experience. And then assess are things that you're evaluating for potential experiments that you're researching, but they're not in production anywhere yet. And then hold are things not that you want everybody to drop immediately, because the hold things are often the cash cows, right? The pieces of legacy uh, that are actually still running your business, but you want to highlight that they, you want to deprecate them in the future. So you don't want anybody to start new projects with it. So having a session and putting this together and then constantly uh, um, maintaining it is a great tool of learning from each other as well in the team and getting an overview of what other teams are actually trying out. And note how you should, um, you, who c you can also use this to determine where you need a lot of guidance and documentation. So the further in the middle something is, the more you should think about, are you giving people enough tools and guidance to use this? Are you making this easy to do? Uh, because that will really help you get people to adopt what you want them to adopt. And another way to structure this, if initially maybe you don't want to come up with a whole radar, but you have at least an idea whenever somebody starts a new team or there's a new product line that you want to start, what are sensible defaults? I really like this term of like having a default, so that implies that you can deviate from the default, but it's like something sensible to start with, and then a team can see what else they need. So let's say you have looked at those building blocks as well and you have lots of energy and good intentions and came up with a radar and some principles, but how do you now actually keep the momentum going and keep it alive? How do you know if what you're doing is effective and how do you know that you're doing autonomy right, that you're actually getting out of autonomy what you want? So the State of DevOps report has some answers on that. 
the um, State of DevOps report. Uh, I hope that some of you have heard about it and also the accompanying book, Accelerate, both excellent, uh, excellent things to read. Um, it's basically research that over the, uh, multiple years that has found relationships between the things that we do in software delivery and how those things impact our performance, our software delivery performance, but also ultimately the organization's performance. So they've actually found um, a predictive relationship between those two things. And good news, they found that autonomy is indeed one of the predictors that uh, influences our performance in a positive way. And they are saying in there that autonomy predicts trust and voice. So trust in the sense of people trusting their leaders and thinking they're fair and honest and trustworthy. And voice meaning that people actually speak up and uh, are not afraid to say the wrong thing and being punished for it. So if you think you're providing autonomy, but you don't see these things, you don't people trust the leaders and you don't see them actually voice dissenting opinions as well, then maybe you're not doing autonomy the right way. Because um, as an example for the principles, if you regularly go to the teams and ask them to justify how they're following the, prin following the principles, and maybe even consciously or subconsciously punish them if they're not, then they're not going to trust you or voice their opinions. They're just going to play hide and seek with you. And trust and voice also, according to the research, positively influence a healthy and highly cooperative organizational culture, which in turn, again, is good for your delivery performance. So autonomy also has an indirect uh, effect on that as well. And another thing that they say that has a positive influence on this highly cooperative culture that you need is to have a climate for learning. So helping each other do the right thing and making it easy to do the right thing. And for me, this is actually the key or the success factor in doing things like principles right. It's kind of the attitude that you take towards these tools. Are you seeing these as tools for telling people what to do or are you seeing them as tools to foster a learning culture? because you can use tools like principles and other things I mentioned as part of that learning culture. So if you talk a lot to each other about these things, then it helps you learn <laughs> from each other. And it can also help you reflect on the progress. And ideally, you have measures in place to measure some of these things and then help you evolve the principles if you're seeing like they're not actually getting you anywhere. And you can also use them as tools to record the why. So why are you doing things the way that you're doing them? Because if you don't know why you're doing it, then you might not, then people might spend a lot of energy on questioning all the time why it is this way, why is it that principle, not that one. I've seen it differently in my previous job. So that's a lot of energy that you could be spending on other things if you had a good way to document how you, uh, how you did that workshop, for example, to get to the principles. What are the anchors you want to get rid of? And so on. So I heard uh, Pat Qua say in an interview recently that these days everybody's doing architecture all the time, especially in a fast-growing organization. And um, I think to, to scale that, you have to find tools to help people learn from each other as much and as fast as possible. And um, yeah, these are some tools that I found <laughs> useful for this, and I'm looking forward to the office hours to maybe hear some other things from what has worked for you. Thank you. Thank you.